Yes, so welcome to the panel session, how to scale up your online workshop to reach 100 learners. Rod one, go to the next slide. My name is Nawe Tatara and I'm the session lead of this panel session. In this panel session, we will present lessons learned and share our experiences from a mega code refinery online workshop. We are seven panelists who played different roles in the workshop. From the left side, myself, Richard Darst, Anne Furio, Petri Yekunen, Matus Karas, Samantha Wicke, and Wadovan Bast. I'm sorry if I pronounced in the wrong manner. So the next slide, please. <clears throat> So first of all, I would like to remind you all that we want to ensure a welcoming and safe space for all our members. And therefore the Carpentry's Code of Conduct applies to this session. Anne is Code of Conduct facilitator of this session. And so for any report, please contact her immediately. In this session, we would like to simulate the same settings as we did in the Mega Code Refinery workshop. Uh, please use HackMD, which is linked from the Etherpad of this session, for asking any questions regarding the contents of, the, of this session. And please use the chat function for communicating about practical and technical problems. We have discussion time at the end of the session, so please use the raise hand button if you'd like to say something, or use the chat function and the backslash hand. Today's presentation starts with the introduction of Code Refinery by Radovan. Then Richard will tell us about a vision of reaching many people at once, where we will have a breakout room session. After that, we will continue to present how we did in the workshop, followed by role presentation by all of us presenters. Finally, we will have a discussion. So okay, I'll was... take over the mic. Yes. So now Radovan was speaking. Hello, everybody. Super nice to see you. Um, I, I have only very few words about the Code Refinery project because this talk is not about the Code Refinery project. It's really about the workshop. But we still thought it would be a shame not to mention at all what we do because I think uh, many things we do are really relevant in the Carpentries universe. So the Code Refinery project exists since 2016. We have funding until next year. We, we work, of course, on the follow-up funding. So we are funded by the Nordic e-infrastructure collaboration, but in co-funded by uh, organizations from Norway, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, and Estonia. We, pro we give workshops all across the Nordics. And well, since this spring, we teach online as everybody else, which opens new opportunities and we will talk about these. Uh, we have important training hubs and these are Trondheim, Oslo, KTH Stockholm and Aalto University. And in over 30 workshops, we have trained over 700 learners. Um, why do I mention Code Refinery? Because I think we have an interesting a lesson portfolio. In contrast to Carpentries, to a typical carpentry's workshop, uh, our learners are not pure beginners. They typically already develop code, they write scripts, but they want to become better at uh, collaboration, at reproducibility, at uh, testing, at documenting. And here I list the curriculum of a typical code refinery workshop, which spans in person over three full days. Uh, online, we teach six half days over two weeks. So we talk about version control, but uh, we put a lot of emphasis on collaboration, collaborative version control, uh, using Git and GitHub, uh, reproducible research, FAIR, research and data. We talk about social coding, software licensing, documentation, Jupyter notebooks, automated testing, modular code development. But there is more. So here you can find uh, uh, more lessons. And of course, we would really like to collaborate on lessons. We would love our lessons to be taken up by the Carpentries community. And here on this slide, I list a few thoughts about the relation to Carpentries. We use the, we use the Carpentries teaching style and format, very much inspired by, by the Carpentries. 
uh, we believe that our lessons fill a gap. Um, so we benefit very much if, if the code refinery workshop participants have been to a carpentry's workshop, then it's really easier for us. But on the other hand, we also think that we can offer maybe more intermediate material for those who are curious to, to continue after our software carpentry or data carpentry workshop. Our lessons are not yet or are not, we, we can discuss whether, whether they should be in the carpentry's incubator because they stand as a mature unit and we have an open governance already. Uh, also, we consider the, the incubator more for novice level lessons, but this is up for discussion. We support the carpentry's coordination in Nordics and Baltics by co-funding uh, this position. So this is really important for us, the, uh, the link to the carpentries. I have here a few questions to you. And this is also to, to again remind that we really welcome questions and comments via the HackMD. And this is also how we do it in a workshop. And these three questions, is there a need for more intermediate advanced carpentry style material? What topics, courses are needed? And what keeps our material from being used already? I would really love to hear from you. And, and I will ask you to, to answer these maybe asynchronously and, and maybe we will have time at the end of the session to return to these, but I will now copy paste these questions and show you again, switch here to the HackMD. And I will switch on top left to the edit mode and somewhere in here, I will put in these questions. This is already done. Yeah, so this is great. Oh yeah, fantastic. Um, and uh, we will, I, I would really love to hear from you and we will return to these answers. And I will now switch back to the presentation mode. I will then give over the microphone to Richard. Yeah, so I'm Richard Darst. So just like many people in late March, we began teaching code refineries online. And our first one was pretty much directly translating um, the in-person workshops to online. But then we started thinking. So the promise of technology is that we can reach many people at once. So why can't we do that? Um, can you advance the slide? Yeah. And yeah, so as we're thinking more, we realized this is actually a good idea, but actually, like it really takes a lot of thought to do it well. So next slide. Yeah. So like I said, our previous workshops were in person and well, a pretty typical size, like 25 people. So there's a trade off between reaching many people and fewer people. Is it too impersonal to reach 100 people at once? What do we lose by doing that? So surely we thought there has to be a way to get the best of both worlds, reach many people, but keep this personal interaction going on. And we basically found that yes, with the right vision and planning with this as your value from the very start, we could reach 100 people without we're really losing that much. So before we go on, we have a question to the audience that we'll discuss in breakout rooms, which is down here. So how can um, a large workshop be more inclusive and how is it less inclusive? And what kind of technical obstacles do you expect? So we would like to break up into breakout rooms for 10 minutes and in the HackMD, you find these questions already there. Um, a vision of reaching many people at once. In my room, we got many ideas. Um, we have time to look at these in details or should we go on with them as an archival? So a lot of them I see is about the difficulty of being heard and getting feedback from people. Are there any other main points to bring up? Should we go on to how we did it? Okay, so this is me here. So I'm Anne, so now I will uh, be talking uh, um, how we did it and we'll 
mostly highlight what we think led uh, to the success of, uh, of this uh, workshop. Um, so there are a mix of uh, a very classical approach, which is like lecturing and call-along exercises in the main room, which you probably see and we will detail later on. Uh, having breakout room, which is quite classical too. What is maybe a new for some of you is uh, this concept of bring your own breakout room, which we will explain what it means. And this is how we scale. And I think the, really the key success was uh, um, we really work together uh, and this is really a teamwork. Well, uh, in face-to-face -face meeting, we usually have the instructor and the helper. And here we have many people with many different roles and we really work and collaborate before, during and after the workshop. So first uh, in the main room, which is like what we have here, uh, one single room with all the learners. Uh, very classical, we always use very short lecture and we explain one concept. And at the same time, we use the hack and be, uh, asynchronously, uh, asynchronously, you can answer and ask questions. So it means uh, uh, you have in addition to this uh, um, explanation, you can go a bit further for some learners or you can see uh, that learners are not understanding what you are talking about. So it's, it's a good thing. We always demonstrate uh, with a very short example uh, what we have explained, which is also very classical. And we often repeat again the explanation, which is also quite uh, common. Um, and we do all the exercises in the breakout rooms and uh, within groups. So this is what we will expect in the next slide. To check understanding, and this is what we have seen in the hacking in the previous discussion, we do more checkpoints to make sure all learners are uh, really uh, understanding what we are discussing. Because for the instructor, it can be a bit more difficult to see um, this. So we added uh, some short survey. Uh, which was mostly very simple question, yes and no, to make sure uh, first uh, people are uh, were, uh, doing the exercise or answering the question or following what we were uh, talking about. Uh, we ask many times, uh, we, are, we are checking the speed and we ask them they can go, if they wanted to go faster or slower using the faster and slower buttons. Um, and we use a lot the hack and D. So uh, to ask a question, and we ask the learners to write down the answer. So this is when this is not yes and no question. It's a, a bit more uh, uh, to write in the hack and be. And we always ask uh, the learners to contribute to discussion with the, uh, with the hack and be. And it works very well. So this is really how we interact a lot with the learners. And even more than in a normal face-to-face -face, uh, workshop. Um, so sometimes we have a code along exercise but we uh, uh, always repeat them or do something similar in a breakout room. And this is mostly because this code along exercise can become more demo-like because uh, um, it can be a bit fast for some of them. And we were always moving on when about 70% have answered to the question or uh, when we have yes or no question. Or, um, so it means we, we can lose some, of them, some people and we delegate many of these uh, uh, potential problem or misunderstanding to the group exercise. Um, and this is what we will see exactly in the next slide. So now these group exercises are very important because uh, the concept is explained by the instructor in the main room, but everything is done in groups. And these uh, groups, uh, we will apply the concept with a, a simple exercise, what we have taught in the main room to check the understanding, but also sometimes to get more explanation and to repeat. So the helper, uh, the help, helpers, they have a very important role here. They uh, clarify the concept. They are the one we can spot misconception. Um, so all the breakout rooms were uh, predefined beforehand. There were a fixed number of people, uh, between three and 10 people in each breakout room. And we had larger breakout rooms. So ideally we wanted to have maximum five people in the breakout room. There's always one helper in the breakout room in each of them. But we allowed larger, make a larger breakout room when learner registered together, which we will explain again in the next slide. So we encourage uh, always in this breakout room uh, to have one learner to share his or her screen during the exercise to, to be more like a group exercise. 
So the, the helpers, they were really uh, have a key role. They were animating the group. They were checking, answering questions. And if they had any problems, they could ask um, someone outside the breakout room. Really explain. So the first day was a bit quiet, and especially when learners didn't know each other. And I think this is probably the same in every setting. Because uh, if you don't know, you're, it, you have more difficult time to interact. And uh, so the helpers um, probably had a bit harder time at, uh, during the first session. So to bring your own breakout room, this is a, a very the key part of scaling. Um, learner could register as team. So we always know uh, it's uh, for a learner, you learn better if you come with a friend, with a colleague, and uh, you learn together. So we really apply this concept saying, okay, you can come with your group, uh, but if you come with your group, you come with a helper. Uh, as a registration uh, time, you include the team name, you include the helper, the name of the helper, and then we uh, always send like personal, personalized emails. Uh, with all the rooms number, so you feel like you are part of a group and you have your own workshop. So this uh, this is what uh, was a bit different. So for instance, a uh, uh, Zoom name when you enter the main Zoom room, you have a, a room number and then your own name. And if you are a helper for this group, we added eight uh, H for helper. So we could identify from the name and from the room uh, who will will be working. So it was very helpful for both the learners and the staff, for the primary staff. So this designated helper or this helper per uh, breakout room it was very often someone who already attended the code refinery in-person workshop. Uh, so having a, already a bit an overview of uh, what we do, but not an expert necessarily. So, or someone in charge of technical support in the team. So they were all working together and they had the same objectives. And this is really uh, how we scale. And a few words about how to prepare helpers for the workshop, because as I mentioned, um, helpers had a key role in scaling up. I have a feeling that helpers are even more important when going from in-person to online and when going from 25 participants to 100 participants. So whether the workshop is perceived as successful or unsuccessful, I think depends mostly on the helpers. It's very, very important. Uh, so what we did to prepare helpers for the workshop, uh, one week before the workshop, we scheduled a meeting with uh, helpers and instructors present. And this has several goals. One is to prep the helpers about tips, you know, code of conduct, but also practicalities uh, of how this is run, how to manage breakout rooms. We also do, we, we do a little like walkthrough choreography through the course schedule so that help us know what to expect, what we do on the different sessions. Uh, I think what is also super important and something that we did, but I think we can do better next time, and we will need to do, give even more time next time, is to do a careful walk through, through the exercises, so that helpers know what to expect in breakout rooms, so that they know what exercises we will do, what optional exercises are there, so that we prepare them for typical pitfalls. And I think this really has a big effect on how the workshop is then for the learners. It's also uh, involving helpers well, it's also a good way to bring them into the community. And maybe today's helpers can be tomorrow's instructors. So this onboarding is really important for the project and for the whole community. The helpers have different experience with the material. So we, we have helpers and we have something we, that we call expert helpers. And we try to communicate also to the learners that we don't expect from helpers to know everything. It's not impossible to, they don't have to know everything. They, they don't know the material to every single word and every single line. But what they can do is they can call other helpers. They can call in expert helpers. These are persons who, who are there to support the helpers in the breakout rooms. They are a bit free floating. These are people who know the material very well. 
and I will say something, I will say more about that later when we discuss uh, the different roles. And, and this is how we can, uh, I think, onboard new helpers without them worrying too much and also without to bring them into the project. So more about that, uh, more about the expert helper role and the helper role later when we discuss the, uh, the different roles. And now I give the microphone to, to Richard. Yeah, so I guess it is sort of obvious that with 100 people, if even a small fraction have problems with installing software, everything gets derailed and you lose time. So we had to be very, um, very adamant that you should do your installation before and also test it before. So in every message we would put, we would send out, we would emphasize this. We had two pre-workshop verification times where helpers and learners would come together. It first off served as a run through for the helpers and learners, but also then anyone that had a question about installation, we could go through and screen share and see if it works. Um, we had these um, procedures like do this with Git, and if you don't get any messages, then you're ready to go. And so in the end, after we did this, we basically didn't have any really major problems. So at least I don't think that we were delayed much because of installation, which is really a lesson that should be used for every workshop. Yes, so we used uh, in the mega code refinery workshop the same as uh, here. We use the HackMD. First of all, this is used as an interactive platform to write questions and answers among all the participants, from learners to instructors, and also from the instructors to learners. And then learners also could uh, answer to learners' question. This is also used as an index to show where we are right now in the session. And it worked as a safer way to ask questions anonymously and also it's easier to ask questions in, for example, an open landscape office. A dedicated person answered and, and watched out all the questions and what's going on in the HackMD and then it's going to be explained later. And by using this, instructors could focus on the lecture and live coding so that they could keep the time schedule more easily. Another advantage is that the learners and helpers found a clean and published copy useful when reviewing lessons afterward. And then we also found that the HackMD as a technical platform was stable most of the time with 50 to 100, per 100 users. It seems depending on the edit history and length and then how many people are getting in depending on its length. And the one thing that we need to be careful is that uh, not to write too long and detailed answers as this may distract the learners from the main lesson. And then as we do here as well, that uh, we use this Zoom chat function for the more technical uh, questions and answers. This is the schematic figure showing how we flexibly assign different roles to code refinery stuff. For example, on the day one, there are two lessons and the member one is an instructor of lesson one and then serves as an expert helper for lesson two and vice versa for the member two. And other members available served as expert helper on the whole or part of the day. And on the day two, there was an absence of a helper in one breakout room which has already many learners and it could be difficult to merge with another breakout room. Then uh, member six served as a helper of the breakout room on that day. So in this way that the online workshop has these great advantages of flexibility if an instructor team is big enough and uh, collaborate very well. On the other hand, in this uh, particular workshop, one member served as HackMD and chat host throughout the workshop, and then myself served as only as a Zoom host. And then on each workshop day, we have the Zoom room open for longer than scheduled time. For example, in the morning, we opened 30 minutes earlier for icebreaker and for an extra technical help. 
And then asking participants to log in earlier helps the Zoom host very well to securely approve the participant's entry. Because in this workshop, we had the registration and I needed to match the people who are coming into the Zoom room with the registration list. And also after the scheduled session is over, we kept the room open for, for example, the briefing among the helpers and the instructors and also to give some uh, time for the individual help by helper or expert helper to each learner. And then some breakout rooms requested to reopen the breakout room to continue their exercises. Yeah, so then once we do the previous things and we move most of the interactive part to breakout rooms, then you can ask why, like, why can't we let more people watch the main lecture, even if we don't have enough helpers for them? So then we got to streaming and recording. So quite basically, Zoom meetings are not the right format for untrusted people to watch because they don't have an isolation between the different um, participants. But streaming does work. So you can take a stream, send it, and then everyone can watch on a platform which lets people read but not write to everyone else. So Zoom can stream directly to Twitch um, and other live streaming services without any software needed. If your organization has it enabled, you basically enter in the streaming URL and so on. Um, and this works pretty well. If you look at our blog post on the workshop, you'll find some um, other um, hints there, because it's not entirely obvious how to keep the privacy of the participants. Um, yeah, so after we're streaming, it's only a short step to recording. And I was a bit surprised at how many learners requested the recordings afterwards, because then they could rewatch the lessons and then basically absorb it at their own pace afterwards. Um, so Twitch is the platform we used. It's originally, it was originally focused on games. Well, it can be used for other things. Basically, some of us knew it and we had used it for another project, so we used it there. We also interacted with the Twitch viewers via Twitch chat and HackMD, which works fairly well. And Twitch has good moderation for untr untrusted viewers also. One thing we should have done differently is had less separation between the streamers and the um, Zoom participants. So that way we could engage the streamers more. As it was now, the streamers were sort of a second, um, second class participant. Yes, so uh, on each workshop day, uh, we had, oh, no, sorry, that day. in this section, the next section, uh, sorry, each of us uh, in the different role will present our own experiences uh, from the workshop. We start with the Petri as a learner and then going to Matus as a helper and then Samantha as a helper on the team, Radovan as an expert helper, Anne as an instructor and myself as Zoom host, and then in the end, Richard as HackMD host. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Petri Ekkonen, and I took part of this workshop as a learner. My background is on the software and hardware industry. Um, most of my personal code development has been one man shop uh, to working on the assembly C and Python languages. Before this workshop, I used Git only as a code backup. I never thought of how to re enable reuse or refining of the code by someone other than myself. To be honest, originally I thought the content of the workshop would cover how to use Git. Um, in my opinion, the uh, workshop was arranged exceptionally well. Pre-workshop instructions and videos were helping to make sure that all tools should be on order before workshop. The support structure from instructors to the learners worked very well. It was educational to observe how helpers themselves and instructors found the help and information. Um, from a learner perspective, some extra effort was required to adapt the learning environment. It was challenging to follow HackMD and teaching occurring at the same time. Afterwards, 
I reviewed these sanitized uh, HackMD documents as there were a lot of good questions and answers. At the beginning, there was little talking in our uh, Zoom breakout room. Later on, at the end of the first day, we learners started to dare ask questions. I think this is not very normal. I would say uh, the arrangements, materials, and superstructure have made this workshop one of the most beneficial workshops during the last four years in the academic world. It is impressive how well this live online course went from technical, pedagogical, and content perspective. As you might guess, I got much more than Git instructions, and I feel that door to something wonderful was opened. Currently, I'm actively using something like 30, 15 to 30 percent of the information that was given to us, but I'm planning to utilize the works, works of material much more in the future. So, great job, team. Thank you. Hello, I am uh, Matos. Uh, and um, about a month uh, before the workshop was going to happen, I learned about it. And um, so on the website, it was saying something like, uh, if you're unsure whether you can be a helper, or if you're asking that question, then you probably can, which I found uh, very motivating. So I immediately registered as a helper. And so as has been said, the helper is assigned a breakout room, which is more or less stable during the whole workshop. So I think I got the breakout room reassigned once, which was also nice. Um, and the helper leads the exercise work in the breakout rooms and uh, helps uh, the learners there. Um, and in my breakout rooms, the learners usually wanted to first work alone through the material on the exercises and then ask questions or maybe share when they were done. And that worked pretty well. And the helper forwards then interesting questions and some difficult problems to the HackMD and the two expert helpers. And I would say that depending on confidence with the exercises, helper only needs very minimum preparation uh, just because the material is prepared so extremely well by the instructors and the code refinery staff. Um, so that was really a very low threshold to become a helper and, and do, the, do the helper work well. Mm. I was lucky that I had two screens and thanks to that I could efficiently interact with HackMD as well and the Zoom chat and uh, com contribute to answering questions there as well and discussing additional advanced stuff. Um, and the advanced stuff I find is is really super interesting in the code refinery material that there are a lot of extra optional exercises for more advanced learners and it's possible to discuss more advanced things on HackMD. I found that uh, that really nice. Yeah, and uh, helping was was a lot of fun and I, I learned enormously a lot. I found it much more fun to, to follow the, the code refinery material as a helper than going through it alone. So it was a really great uh, way to get exposed to it. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Samantha Witke, and I'm a PhD student at Aalto University and a researcher at the Finnish Geospatial Research Institute. And I basically brought my own breakout room. So I actively promoted at the FGI uh, that we will have this course and that it would be cool if some people would join me. So five people uh, in the end joined me and they knew also that uh, I myself have been visiting this same course in person about a year before the mega code refinery so they knew that I was not an expert but I had used these tools since I've myself visited the course and I think this lowered the barrier a lot to uh, share the screen to interact to ask questions since we know each other beforehand at least we had seen each other beforehand in the institute and um, also i feel it was sometimes a bit easier to explain concepts or workflows in more work related terms for us that uh, maybe will not work in a, a breakout room with uh, people with different backgrounds uh, i also uh, always uh, liked the opportunity to call for help uh, in the HackMD 
to ask more specific questions to the expert helpers or discuss some topic that uh, came up during the exercise sessions. Um, but then, of course, uh, with all the work-related explanations, it's also quite easy to get lost uh, in work-related topics rather than doing the exercise. So one has to keep an eye on that and also on the time that is given for the exercises. Overall, it was a really good experience and I again learned a lot. Thank you. Yeah, this workshop was a lot of fun. Um, so I want to tell you a bit about the role of the expert helper. So again, I'm Radovan Bast, University of Tromso. I've been with the Code Refinery project from the start. An expert helper is somebody who knows the material well, typically somebody who has maybe taught it a couple of times or contributed to it. So what I was doing when I was not instructing at this workshop was to either watching the HackMD or really trying to either wait for questions, but uh, what we encourage expert helpers to do is to cycle through breakout rooms. So we are not assigned to specific breakout rooms, but to jump between them and to see how it is going. And one can then uh, either probe a bit the mood uh, to make sure that the helpers are doing okay, or uh, encourage discussions. Some rooms have been very silent the first day. And of course that is okay if the learners prefer to, prefer to work that way. Uh, but one can also then start a discussion, maybe ask a question or tell, maybe give some additional additional hints. Uh, we have, I have found it useful to, in some exercises, to encourage learners to share their screen in a breakout room. So one of the learners would share screen and we others would navigate. Uh, you know, click here, click there. Uh, aha, this is the error and now we, now we took it together try to solve the, solve the problem. I found that good ped pedagogy was happening there. Also provide advice uh, when needed. And we have used uh, either the chat, but it can be, because it can be a bit difficult to watch all the streams if you have not too many screens, but also asking for help via the HackMD uh, worked. Like we need somebody in room two uh, and then and then somebody got assigned. This was coordinated very well. And then I will give the microphone over to Anne. Yeah, so I was a, an instructor um, in this workshop. So I'm working at the University of uh, Oslo in Norway in the Department of Geosciences. Um, so I taught from home, so I had only one screen. I had a laptop, so I was uh, extremely worried initially because uh, there were many different channels. But in fact, I, I found it was the easiest workshop to teach because uh, I was the least important person. The instructor is not so important in a mega code refinery workshop. You have much less pressure and uh, it's easier to focus on the teaching because you have a team behind you and you have uh, uh, the HackMD host, uh, the uh, Zoom host, you have helpers, expert helpers, etc. So you feel that like anyway, someone will cover for you if there is anything wrong happening. So it was very relaxing, very nice. At the same time, you can focus a lot more on uh, trying to get feedback from the learner. So, so uh, I was focusing on what kind of, uh, is it the right time to ask uh, if this is, uh, if the speed is okay or if uh, uh, you have understood, uh, etc. So it, it is easier to ask frequently this question and to check with, the, with your learner. Um, so one disadvantage is, uh, which I found was a code along session. Uh, they were sometimes a, a bit too fast or very fast because you, you, you code and at the same time they were supposed to follow along. And I had a feeling they were more like demos, which is uh, uh, what is used uh, by many others. So uh, it's important to make sure uh, the same kind of exercise is repeated in a, in a breakout room. Um, I also found it was very useful to be at the same time an instructor and an expert helper during the workshop because then you have the opportunity to visit a breakout room and to really discuss uh, with them, um, with learners, which is what we do in the face-to-face -face workshop. So overall, I found it was very positive experience and uh, 
it can lower the barrier for new instructors uh, because they only have to focus on uh, instructing and teaching their part. So it can be a good thing. Sorry, it takes some time. Uh, you, I hope you hear me. So uh, myself, um, again, that uh, uh, my name is Nawe, and then I'm working at the University of Oslo Science Library. And then uh, I was actually hired at the library in the last October as a regional coordinator for the carpentry and the cold refinery. So uh, my background is not technically the software development, even though I took the PhD in informatics. And then uh, my purpose is to help the researchers to get this open science skills as a part of this digital scholarship center project. And then uh, I, uh, my, my role as the Zoom host is uh, dedicated to for the Zoom room management and including this recording and the streaming to the Twitch TV. And the main the, the tasks are the Zoom room um, participant control, like uh, participant entries, and then asking the uh, assigning the co-host to the expert helpers, which needs to go around the breakout rooms. And then uh, communication with the participants with many different channels. Some people who are suddenly saying that they cannot attend today as a helper or such, or sending the emails. And so that I need to pay attention to many different channels, not only within the Zoom channel. And also that breakout room management was quite important and then it required some flexibility. As I said, that's if the helper is absent then or the learners, number of learners on one particular breakout room is too few, then they suggested to merge the two or three breakout rooms. And then, but still then some breakout rooms really wanted to keep them as themselves to one breakout room. So that's the, this kind of, uh, flexibility and then uh, smooth communication was important. And then uh, all the details about the tips and tricks and then uh, something lessons learned are all written in our blog post, as well as today it was published in the Carpentries blog. So please take a look at that too. Thank you. Yeah, so it's Richard here again. I'm a staff scientist at Alta University. So my role was the HackMD host, which basically meant that I focused on watching the HackMD and making sure questions were answered there. So that doesn't mean I'm the only one answering questions, but I basically made sure that everything got some answer. I would do other things like if I saw an important question that needed to be raised to the instructor, I could bring it up right away. Um, I'd keep the hack and be organized, so basically consistent formatting, so it's easy to follow. Make sure people are writing in the right places, like at the bottom. Um, also do things like write in, like we're beginning exercises now. This is the link. It lasts until this long, which provides a set of meta information about what's going on to keep everyone on the same page. Um, let's see. One other important thing is that people, like the breakout rooms could ask for help and then I could see that and then direct someone to go look at it. And it's quite important, I think, to have a different person do this because it's, it's a different kind of cognitive effort than watching the lesson. So here, I'm only watching this document with a passive knowledge of what's going on in the lesson. But if there were questions about specific problems, then it would be a lot harder to answer that. Yes. Okay, and now we are doing super well with the time. Um, and in the final segment of this session, we we wanted to have a discussion. So we will have a QA and a session and uh, look into the future. And I have a couple of uh, questions or thoughts here, but, uh, but hopefully we have uh, we will hear the questions from you and uh, or maybe answers to our questions but first first of all let me maybe bring up these points so we expect that we will continue with online workshops um also 
after the COVID situation, whenever that will be, because um, they are not really a replacement, but complementary. There are some benefits to online workshops that we have uh, also discussed in the breakout room earlier today. Of course, there are also challenges. Uh, the advantages are that we have potentially more reach, uh, also geographical reach. Uh, it is cheaper to participate, both in travel and time. Also, if you are not really sure whether this workshop is for you, um, I think the barrier is lower to, to sign up and to commit. It also, remote workshops make it possible to involve remote helpers. And I see that as an opportunity to, to then recruit future instructors. Um, large online workshops and streaming may not work for all audience types. So there is a, there is a question about, of course, diversity, the technical background, uh, different countries have different network bandwidth. Um, one thing we want to do in future is to encourage and accept observers more. So to offer, uh, to not have these two tiers of participants. So we are, we are even thinking about a streaming only workshop, uh, which would be complementary to a, like a Zoom only workshop. Uh, where people from any place can participate and everybody's on the same level. Uh, how can we encourage participation while uh, protecting privacy when streaming and recording? So this is a balance that we need to strike and what we have tried is to uh, stream the main room and to have all the discussion in breakout rooms and to not record and not stream the breakout rooms so that People are not afraid to ask uh, novice questions uh, and are not afraid of being recorded or streamed somewhere. And how can we make a federated model the other stream? And, and we don't have answers to all these questions. Um, I want to point out that, of course, we would love you to, to be, you, you can join us, be, you can be involved if uh, any of that was interesting, also in terms of teaching curriculum please reach out. So here are links to the website, to Twitter, to our chat, anybody can join and, and we can talk more. But I would really like to, that we use the remaining time to answer questions. Um, again, as a reminder, what you can do is on the chat, you can indicate. So on the Zoom, through the Zoom controls, you can indicate, you can raise hand and uh, or type, uh, raise hand in the chat and uh, I cannot see the chat right now because I'm sharing screen. So, uh, so we would really love to hear your questions or uh, if you have experience with any of the topics that we have uh, raised here, we would love to hear and learn from, so that we also learn from you and that we all learn from each other. I will maybe now stop sharing so that I have the possibility to actually see the chat and also see the HackMD. Yeah, there's some questions about how much time it took to prepare things. And there's some answers in the um, HackMD. My overall impression is it took a whole lot of time for me. But I was planning basically two mega workshops at the same time that would happen right after each other. And also, I was like sort of at the same time trying to make sure we have this shared vision of what the mega workshop would even be like. And if we did it again, it would be a lot more straightforward since we basically have all of the messages we sent. We figured out how to do a registration and use our registration system. And um, so the question in terms of days or hours to prepare, um, I mean, well, in the past, maybe I spent a month working on it along with other things. In the future, I would expect maybe a few days overall, maybe a week, depending on how much vision making you're doing and the other 
helper training you do and so on. But compared to um, helping five times as many people as you normally would, it's definitely a lot less than five times the effort. The maximum stream viewers was about was it 15 or 20 or 25. Anyway, on the order of, I'd say 15 to 25. But also we didn't advertise it very much because basically until the day before, we didn't know we would actually do the stream. So everywhere we said, we might do the stream, check it out. But if we um, put more marketing, I think we could get a lot more. Uh, the way we did the workshop was over two weeks, three half days per week. Yes, so it was 9, 9 a.m. to 12 a.m. with some time before and some time after. Yeah, nine, 9 to 12 in the CESD and then uh, 10 to 13 in EASD. No. The CESD is the two hours ahead ETC. Is it correct? Yeah. Mm. Okay. yeah. I, I would also note to this uh, two, two weeks, so kind of six and a half days instead of three days normally, that it was also a measure that made it uh, much more accessible for a broader range of people who just cannot afford spending three full days or a full day at all. So the half days were also very nice compared to usual workshops. And so, it's only possible because it was online. I mean, people could not uh, travel for two weeks, of course. Yeah. As a learner, I actually signed that also. I wouldn't have been able to take full, time, full day uh, training. As Anything? much as you there is interest in, in participating via Twitch as a yeah. learner in a future workshop and, and we will explore that more. Yeah. I think it's an interesting, interesting model. One of my dreams would be we can host the Twitch stream and then say, let's say it's a university in, well, North America that wants to host it. They have their own registration to attend. So we have the stream, they manage their own breakout rooms. So we basically will say, okay, we're going to break up room time. And then well, the people in the local site go together and do the exercises and then rejoin the stream when it continues. Because with a confident enough helper, we wouldn't even be needed there to like, spread it um, horizontally like that. It's a good question. Do we feel that streaming has advantages over recording and live communication channels? By live communication channels, do you mean record it and then play it back together um, in person? Um, and that's really an open question, I'd say. So my thought is it depends on the vision of the person who's doing it. Like with the stream by having it being produced live, maybe you can build a community together about it, but like watching it together, which is a good thing, but mm, no. I mean, one advantage is that there is also the discussion via HackMD going. So while people watch the live stream, mm -hmm. they can also participate with others who are not in the same location. Yeah, the, as opposed to recording when it's streamed that uh, the one who is streaming can also react directly to, to the 
questions on the live communication channels. Yeah. So I think you should have, a, if you were doing the streaming thing, again, have the dedicated HackMD host who's watching the things coming in and then can feed that back to the instructor. Because especially once streaming, the instructor probably can't react to all the different participants, but with a um, little bit of help, I think that we can keep up the interaction. And I think next time we will maybe go for a single HackMD because maybe we were too worried about HackMD vandalism from somebody who has not registered, but maybe this is not really a, well, maybe we need to solve it when the problem happens. Yeah. Yeah, so we had a separate HackMD for the streaming participants that was mostly empty, so it didn't feel very engaging. So I would have had the registration for everyone that was not able to attend because we were full, then send them the HackMD link, the main HackMD link and the streaming link and let them follow along that way. And also a way to register and just say, I want information on the workshop, but I don't plan on actually attending the Zoom call. Please send me the HackMD so I can follow along at my own pace. Also about the streaming, when I was reading about lurkers, which appears to be the technical term for non-participants um, in a community which don't actively contribute back to the community, there's a lot, or there, there's, it says that by, lurkers are a good thing for your community because people can watch and see how the community works before they begin, before they become active themselves. So by having the stream, which is almost like being there in person, then we can make them feel a part of the community a bit more than watching a recording separately. Well, um, let's see. Well, they don't feel this pressure to actually actively um, contribute back, ask questions, and feel like they're taking up resources from other people. So I can imagine some people would watch the stream and say, oh, this is a nice community. I'm going to register for the next one. And then they have a good background. They know how it will work. And then they can immediately you know, take part. Yeah, so as the forum question, I think that we tried to make HackMD serve the role as a forum. So um, like imagine a chat system going on parallel. Then if you don't answer something right away, it scrolls up and it's sort of lost. But HackMD, we tell people always right at the bottom. So it's roughly linear. But then we can go up and rearrange it to keep it organized so that um, others can, well, so that it still makes sense afterwards. And if you don't get a question right away, you can probably get an answer later. What is also nice is that we can have sort of threading by indenting. And this was found to be really intuitive also to the learners. So we had sometimes learners answering questions of other learners, which I think is really nice. Yeah. Also that we can offer several answers to one question of increasing, I don't know, sophistication. Uh, one question that we were all asking ourselves, and it was mentioned also in this presentation, is that we sometimes we were unsure whether we should really. So there is this risk of giving really good answers on the HackMD and distracting participants from actually listening and watching the the Zoom part. Mm -hmm. So there's a bit of a balance, and sometimes then we need to be careful not to go into the rabbit hole. Some questions we can maybe postpone until later and tell participants that we, yes, we will answer these questions later a bit asynchronously to not to distract too much. So it's a bit of a balance. So it went, it went much better than we expected to, to my surprise. Uh, has it been mentioned here that we did hit um, a, sort of a HackMD limitation when there were 100 and, 
hundred plus people editing at the same time. Yes, it was mentioned very briefly, but we saw that especially when the document grew very long. So what what then helped? But I'm not sure. So what seemed to be seemed to help was then to move some of the old discussions to a side the document and recombine them later to have the active discussion in a, a bit of a smaller document. We also asked people to be stay in view mode until they wanted to edit something, but maybe that's not actually a solution. I'm not sure. Yeah, that, that seemed to be helping. Uh, I remember mm. that, uh, yeah, if there were many people in the editing mode at the same time and then they got out of it, then the things improved. So that seemed to be a solution. And we were doing it so that there was one HackMD for every day in the end, kind of, wasn't it? Yeah, you published the notes separately. Yeah. You track them separately. With links between the, you know, to the two mm -hmm. And this publishing of the discussion, that, is, that I, think, I think is really, really important and appreciated. And HackMD also makes this really easy in contrast to maybe other tools because at the end of the day, I can clearly end up. I can maybe anonymize, remove the names, but then I can export the markdown and then it's easier for us to attach it to the website without doing a lot of converting. Yeah. So here's a question to our audience. So during this Q and A, I think almost no, none of the audience has been asking things by voice, but there has been this pretty active discussion going on via um, HackMD here. What are your feelings on this? Are you feeling engaged? Business working. Also, is it about the is is recording affecting it? Is recording and streaming affecting the 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 way where we ask questions? Also, did we mention how HackMD, since everyone can write at the same time, then people who don't want to interrupt someone else can also get their points in there, which is very, very, very important. Richard, you may have noticed that the comment in the chat that it's uh, yeah. written engaged yeah so I... someone says engaged mm -hmm. we also started collecting feedback via the hackmd and then to attach it to the q a again anonymized but it's nice if we can actually share the feedback because if we collect feedback in a different document maybe over sticky notes it's mm -hmm. i was never sure whether i can really share it later but here at the at the um, beginning of workshops we make then we make them clear that we make clear of what will be published what will not be published and i find it useful for me as well the, the project manager that i can I can then later refer to also the feedback and show it to other people when we want to motivate about why we should do more of this. Maybe one word from the learner perspective is that <clears throat> when I say that it's, it was difficult to follow HackMD and the teaching, it came on the situation when the discussion went sometimes very deep on the on the topic on the HackMD and at the same time there was coming new material as, as uh, somebody was teaching. So so I always like had an eye on the HackMD, sometimes asked some questions there, actually got a lot of help also uh, on the runtime of the, of the uh, teaching. But when we had like uh, two difficult topics on the HackMD and two difficult topics as a learner. Uh, that was the only point when I was feeling a little bit uh, overloaded. And then I just dropped the HackMD and was reading that afterwards. But it was really, really helpful.
Yeah, that's really good feedback because I, I was also guilty. Sometimes it's really fun to answer to write these answers because when you and then you want to really go deep, but but then I had to stop myself and say that no, no, this is really not helping. Maybe I will write it later. Yeah. Yes, hack and behost. Sometimes I see a detailed answer, so I go up above it and then write a simple answer, and like say, okay, this is what you need to know for now, but in the future, um, like these are the detailed things. Uh I would like to say, remind you all one thing that uh, if you go back to this uh, etherpad of the session, you will find this uh, links to the feedback survey under the host call details at the bottom. So please uh, go there and then uh, give us uh, feedback and also to the Carpentry Con uh, Conference Committee. Thank you. Uh, Radva, are we going to continue the discussion if there's any more? Yeah, I guess we could stop the recording and streaming and then see what, if anyone else has stuff to say. Okay, so I will stop the recording and the streaming now. Thank you for those viewers from the Twitch uh, TV and we will stop the sharing now. What we can do is like in Code Refiner Workshop that we kind of officially close it, but we still hang around for yeah. for more discussion. And please also let me thank all the contributors to this lesson, uh, to this uh, to this session, Nawe and Richard and Anne, Petri, Matush, uh, Samantha, and a special thanks for Nawe for really organizing this uh, uh, this session in the in this conference.